Hello, and thank you for joining us on MedEd Talks. You're listening to the podcast series, RSV Immunoprophylaxis, an Obstetrician's Guide to Enhancing Comprehension and Counseling. This continuing education activity is provided by Vindico Medical Education and supported by an educational grant from Sanofi. For program details, including how to claim credit, please refer to the episode notes or the CE information. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joseph Domikowski. Hello, I'm Joe Domikowski, professor of pediatrics and professor of microbiology and immunology in the Department of Pediatrics at SUNY Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York. I'm joined here with, by my colleague, Dr. Elisa Kachikis, who is assistant professor of maternal fetal medicine in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Washington in Seattle. Welcome, Dr. Kachikis. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So today I thought we could discuss the available options for RSV infant immunoprophylaxis. And maybe to get started, could you walk us through the distinct mechanisms of action between maternal RSV vaccination during pregnancy and infant-directed monoclonal antibody immunoprophylaxis? So the last couple of years have been really exciting in terms of finally having great methods to prevent severe RSV illness in small babies. And remember, RSV-associated illness is one of the number one causes of severe uh, morbidity and mortality in infants globally and the number one reason for hospitalizations in the United States among small infants. So as we kind of talk about these different methods, we'll talk about the um, efficacy in the clinical trials and endpoints, and those are all related to hospitalizations or um, severe medically attended illness in infants. The two methods we have, we have two really great options. Both provide the baby with passive immunity, which means that the infant itself doesn't have to respond to a vaccine per se. One of the methods is an RSV vaccine that be, that can be given in pregnancy. What happens with this is a concept called maternal immunization. So that's when a pregnant person receives the vaccine, mounts an immune response, makes antibodies. The antibodies, especially those more mature antibodies, the IgG, cross over the placenta to the fetus during pregnancy, starting in the second trimester, really ramping up into the third trimester. And those antibodies are then in the fetus and then obviously in the neonate at delivery, which can help protect the baby. So the RC vaccine is an option that's um, recommended to be given, you know, 32 to 36 weeks and six days during pregnancy, and that will help protect the baby, similar to um, when we give the Tdap vaccine during pregnancy. Another option to prevent RSV illness in infants is to give the infant a monoclonal antibody injection. And that injection has these um, antibodies that were um, developed to last a longer period of time in infants and also protect them from RSV illness in the first few months of life. Yeah, that's great. Um, you mentioned the antibody transfer in the um, second and third trimester. How does the timing of administration of the maternal vaccination during pregnancy versus that direct administration to the infant after birth influence the onset and duration of the protection against RSV? So for the infant to get the most benefit from uh, a vaccine during pregnancy, so from maternal immunization, it's best to give the vaccine a few weeks before the delivery. So that's why the recommendation is to give the vaccine between 32 weeks and 36 weeks and six days so that the pregnant individual has time to mount a immune response and for those antibodies to transfer over the placenta. Now the baby will still get benefit, but it is recommended to give that vaccine at least two weeks before delivery just to allow that process to happen. Conversely, when you give the monoclonal antibody, the injection has the antibody in it and the baby will be protected from that point onward. What about the pivotal clinical trial evidence? What does it tell us about how well, uh, how effective and safe uh, these two strategies are in preventing RSV-related hospitalizations? So the clinical trials have been really um, promising in terms of just protection for the infants and then also safety data for one of the monoclonal antibodies, nirsevimab. That's the one that's readily available right now. The Harmony clinical trial showed that the monoclonal antibody was 82% effective at preventing hospitalizations in infants over the first 180 days of life. When you think about all the hospitalizations that in the past used to happen because of RSV 
illness to have a method that's 82 percent effective is um, just really great for the maternal rsv vaccine in pregnancy that clinical trial was called the matisse study that trial showed that the maternal vaccine was 82% effective in the first 90 days of birth in preventing RSV-related illness, which is also really, really promising um, and great data to have as we kind of move forward into collecting real-life data. There's also a newer monoclonal antibody that has recently been approved uh, for infants. It's called uh, clasrovimab, and that trial also has shown that that monoclonal antibody is 80 to 90% effective in preventing hospitalizations in young infants. That's great. Um, you, you mentioned the data from the Harmony study, and that study was, of course, done in, in Europe, in Germany, the UK, and very impressive data. Um, now that nirsevimab is registered in more than 50 countries in the world, how is that real-world evidence beginning to shape our understanding of effectiveness and uptake, not just for nirsevimab, um, but for other strategies that we have. So as the two different methods have been utilized, we've been able to collect more data from um, studies that are not the clinical trials. So for example, in the US, uh, we have data that was just recently presented by the CDC at the ACIP meeting showing that monoclonal antibodies and or vaccine during pregnancy is very effective at reducing emergency room visits, RSV-associated hospitalization, and RSV-associated ICU admissions in young infants. And then there are also studies from sites outside of the U.S., including from Argentina and from the United Kingdom, showing that um, the maternal vaccine is uh, 70 to 80 percent effective in decreasing RSV-associated hospitalizations in infants less than three months of age or even six months of age. Yeah, it's pretty impressive, right? The real-world effectiveness data that's coming in for these different strategies that we have all really mirror what we experienced in those phase three clinical trials that were designed to show efficacy. Now we're seeing real world effectiveness that meets or exceeds. It's, it's very exciting, as you mentioned, very exciting time. Um, how, how should we as clinicians approach discussions around choosing between the very different options of um, maternal vaccination or infant immunoprophylaxis, or even those instances where we might want to identify babies that might benefit from both? For the RSV vaccine during pregnancy, uh, in terms of eligibility criteria, the RSV vaccine is recommended to be administered between September 1st, um, so in the fall, and then um, January 31st of the following year. And that is to target uh, young infants during their first RSV season. Uh, so if a pregnant person is not eligible to receive the RSV vaccine during that time period, so that person is not between 32 weeks and 36 weeks and six days, then the monoclonal um, antibody option is a really great option too. And then, you know, for the RSV vaccine and pregnancy, there are some other thoughts about uh, breast milk or human milk benefits. So mucosal immunity benefit for the infant and also benefit for the pregnant person herself that just were None of that data was collected during these clinical trials, or at least not published yet. And so um, hopefully these studies will be coming in the future. In terms of when to consider the monoclonal antibody, even if a pregnant person has received a vaccine. So for people who did not receive a vaccine during pregnancy, those infants should absolutely receive a monoclonal antibody for their first um, RSV season. Other reasons to consider uh, administering an RSV monoclonal antibody for infants whose mothers have been vaccinated is if the um, mother was vaccinated less than two weeks before delivery. If the uh, mother is someone who's immunocompromised or taking medications that cause immunosuppression. People who have other conditions that might decrease transplacental antibody transfer, for example, people living with HIV. Infants who have underlying cardiac or pulmonary conditions and are at risk for severe RSV disease. Um, and then other infants who have other reasons for having lost some of the maternal antibodies. So babies that were on ECMO or bypass for various procedures should also receive a monoclonal antibody. 
injection after birth. That's great. So all infant protection, essentially. We have these great strategies. They're highly effective with really nice, favorable safety profiles. All we need to do is use them. I think uh, for last season, we were just over 50% um, total coverage for maternal vaccination plus um, nirsevimab. So it'll be interesting, I think, going forward, uh, how much progress we're going to be making in the coming season. Do you have any summary or additional concluding statements before we wind up? I think the RSV vaccine in pregnancy or the monoclonal antibody are both really great options. Um, and uh, for people who are not eligible to receive a vaccine, the monoclonal antibody should absolutely be considered. Sometimes for infants at severe risk for RSV uh, illness, both the RSV vaccine during pregnancy and then also the monoclonal antibody can be very effective in decreasing risk for these very, very um, sick infants. And all the safety profiles have looked great. So we're really hoping for um, improved outcomes for these very young infants when it comes to RSV infections. Well, yes, exciting times, as you said. Thank you so much, Dr. Kachikas, for this great discussion. And thanks to the audience for listening. Please remember to take the post-test and evaluation to receive CE credit and to tune in for additional episodes within this podcast series. Thanks again. Thanks again for joining us on MedEd Talks. To claim credit, please refer to the episode notes or the CE information. For other episodes in this series, search for RSV Immunoprophylaxis.